Hello, my name's Tamsin Taylor and I'm an artist and an art lover. I love talking about painting and sculpture and architecture and beautiful things of all sorts. I love sharing them with other people. I love sharing my insight. And I love sharing my photographs of places that I've been and interesting things that I have seen. So if you're the sort of person who is not bored by other people's travel tales, you might be the sort of person who will enjoy my videos. I want to tell you about my travels. This year, of course, I haven't been anywhere very much. I have been to London once and um, went to an art gallery, came home and caught COVID-19 on the train. And I haven't been anywhere ever since. Uh, it, it's all I can manage to do to get out to do a bit of grocery shopping and walk by the river. But there you are. Um, last year, 2019, was very different. I went to Florence early in the year, in March, and then later in the year my sister arrived and said, let's go to Florence. So I did it again, and the second time I saw some things that I didn't see the first time. Now I have been to Florence before, but I was able to catch up on all sorts of wonderful things at a at a slightly slower pace because I move at a slightly slower pace now and rather than walking up to the top of San Miniato al Monte we got a bus and walked down. We went travelling from Stansted, we went to Pisa, spent a day in Pisa and found it very easy to catch the train from Pisa to Florence. We found a, a very helpful and obliging person at the railway station who sold us the tickets that we needed for the return journey that would take us right through to the airport. That worked out very smoothly indeed. Now, about buying tickets, everything that you want to see in Florence, you have to buy a ticket for absolutely everything. In many other cities, you can see some of the sites for free. If you're in London, for example, you can visit about nine or ten or maybe more of the most famous museums, uh, um, uh, the National Gallery, um, the British Museum, the V&A, the Science Museum, they're all free. But in Florence, you pay for absolutely everything. A number of the churches charge a fee if you want to go into the church. Between service times, as a tourist, you pay to go in. So you need to be um, aware of that and book online. For some of the places that you would most want to go, like the Uffizi Gallery, which is really quite a, a small space for an art gallery. The, the tickets are all timed and um, in fact if you buy a ticket that's going to take you to three or four different locations the Uffizi will be first on your list and you'll get your ticket stamped um, when you go in there. Everything has to be timed accordingly. I want to say something about the nature of the artwork which one sees in Florence. There is some, some general artwork, you can see some modern art there, but on the whole when you go to Florence you are looking at late medieval, early renaissance and mannerist art. Mannerist is the time that incorporates the artists who were influenced by Michelangelo. So that is art of the 1600s. So uh, if you have an interest in art from
from, say, the 1300s through to the 1600s, then Florence is an absolutely wonderful place to visit. You need to be aware of the fact that the vast majority of the artwork is Christian in nature. So you will see hundreds of representations of the Virgin Mary and Child. You will see a very large number of crucifixes. You'll see a very large number of statues of St. John the Baptist, who is the patron saint of Florence, and quite a number of um, artworks that represent various aspects of uh, biblical stories, both from the Christian Gospels and also from the Jewish scriptures. One of the people who was very popular as a patron of Florence is uh, David, David the shepherd boy who became the king and wrote the Psalms. So you will find um, representations of David being among the most popular artworks in Florence. And my recommendation is that if you don't have a Judeo-Christian background, that you do some homework before you get there. Uh, otherwise, you're simply not going to know what you're looking at, and it's very helpful if you do. If you don't like Christian art, then don't go to Florence. If you don't want to see hundreds of representations of the Virgin Mary, then don't go to Florence. If you don't want to see hundreds of crucifixes, don't go to Florence. And um, I, I say this advisedly because oh, I have gone into some of the most amazing rooms and some of the wonderful galleries, the Pitti Palace, for example, and into the fantastic baptistry in Florence and been uh, surrounded by young people who only wanted to sit down and, and play on their, their tablets or their mobile phones. So they're not even taking selfies. I, I, I couldn't understand that they're all sitting there going like, like this when they could have been taking a fantastic photograph of themselves with um, an enormous, fierce mosaic of, of Christ in majesty looking over their shoulder. On the other hand, on my first trip, I came back as we were flying over England and about to descend. A teenager across the aisle from me said to the young man who was sitting next to him, I never knew that I could love those 14th century altarpieces the way I do. And uh, I just, um, I, I rejoiced at that because that was a young man who had uh, really got full benefit out of his visit to Florence. He hadn't simply seen a Leonardo da Vinci and a statue by Michelangelo and the inside of the McDonald's restaurant. He had looked at one of the um, most important caches of treasures, and that is uh, the fantastic altarpieces that are still in place in so many of the churches. Rare and wonderful objects uh, shining with gold and uh, um, so much love and devotion has been put into the creation of these works of art. Uh, they've been created for the most part by patrons, by wealthy families, or by um, the various guilds of the city, and um, put above altars, both public and private. And some of these earlier uh, ones, which are extraordinary, and I particularly love them, so I was very, um, very pleased to hear this young man say that he loved them too, and I was able to tell him that if he goes to the National Gallery in London, 
they have a lovely collection of them and there's a few more in the Victoria and Albert. Now why is Florence such a draw to tourists? Well it's the names that are associated with it. It's the city of Leonardo da Vinci. It's the city of Michelangelo. It's the city of Botticelli. If you want to see Botticelli's Primavera and um, uh, the birth of Venus, there they are. Michelangelo's David is there in the Academia and um, a number of Leonardo's, not, not the Mona Lisa and not the Last Supper, uh, but the huge unfinished adoration of the Magi, the angel that he painted in the painting by uh, Verrocchio, Verrocchio's uh, Baptism of Christ was an angel by Leonardo. And uh, so you could go and, and see these and, and really enjoy them. These are the most famous things. Uh, the city is also the city of the wealthy banking family, the Medici, with many wonderful stories associated with them. And they were major patrons of the art. Uh, they were patrons of Michelangelo for a start. Botticelli, who was considerably older than Michelangelo, and who painted for them for many years, they were the patrons of um, a number of philosophers and writers, people important in Italian literature, in using the uh, vernacular Italian and in translating various things from classical languages into the Italian language, making them available. All sorts of wonderful things that came out of the Medici Academy. They were also the patrons of the architects. Brunelleschi, that Michelangelo of course, who designed the Laurentian Library for the Medici, but also Michelozzo, who built their fabulous palace. And thereby hangs a tale. It's very important, very significant, that during this period, during the earlier part of the period that I have mentioned, Florence was a republic. Uh, they were very, very protective of their republic at a time when most cities were ruled by dukes or princes. Now we have here, in the 1400s, a very different situation to that which existed in England, which had been a monarchy for many years, and a, a relatively stable monarchy since um, William the Conqueror came across the Channel in 1066. So here, hundreds of years later, you've got um, towns and provinces that were all ruled by their own local ruler and were always forming alliances either between themselves or with outsiders such as the King of France or with the Pope and you generally had to keep friendly with the Pope and if you fell out with him um, it could be very nasty indeed. You needed to keep the peace with your neighbours and Florence was not always very good at that. Florence was an extremely vulnerable city because it was in a valley on a navigable river. And the navigable river was its source of wealth because Florence was a major uh, cloth producing town. And the, the cloth works were all downstream from the city so that the water that fled through the town was not polluted. That was the way in which this was usually done. People became very rich from the cloth trade and um, so many people had money that you then had the banking corporations starting up. These big banking families of whom the Medici became the most significant. They had branches in many of the major trading centres of Europe In a city that is republican in nature, 
run by the Signoria, the old men, elected from the eight sections of the city and uh, representing the wealth of the city in terms of the various guilds or trade unions for the most part, including the Guild of Bankers, I might say. Anybody who rose above themselves and became too wealthy was treated with a certain amount of suspicion. And among those people treated with suspicion was Cosimo Medici, who employed the architect Nicolozzo to build him the grandest palace. Not some nice villa out of town, but an enormous palace right in the centre of the city, near the church of San Lorenzo. Well, the architect presumably been to Rome and he styled it in the classical imperial style. It had enormous great walls, rows of windows and a huge jutting cornice that overhangs the street by a couple of metres at least, maybe more. It really is a very grand building, the Medici Riccardi Palace, as it is now known, because the Riccardi family lived there after the Medici. Anyway, when Cosimo built himself this, the Signoria looked at him rather suspiciously, decided he was trying to set himself up as a prince and send him into exile. Now, eventually, he was asked to come home and um, his his sons managed things in a fairly low-key sort of a manner, just got richer and richer. And then one of them had two sons, Lorenzo and Giuliano. Lorenzo and Giuliano were seen as being the, um, the gems of the city. Why Lorenzo? was, I really don't know. He was rather below average height. He, he had a an overbiting jaw and a very grating uh, a voice and a nose like a ski run, or maybe it had been broken, I'm not sure. But he was charming. He was very charming and everybody loved and adored him, apart from the Patsy family, the Pope, the... Um, Duke Federico de Montefeltro of Urbino, one or two other people, and um, they got up a conspiracy against the Medici brothers. And on, let me see, Ascension Day, I think it was, put me right if I'm wrong, uh, they sent a group of assassins into the cathedral who attacked Lorenzo and Giuliano while they were kneeling with their heads bowed at the altar, just at the moment at which the the priest raised the host so that everybody's head was bowed, they sprang out at that moment, succeeded in killing the younger brother, Giuliano. Lorenzo miraculously got out of it with just a, a, a knife wound at the back of his neck. And the town was absolutely incensed. The assassins believed that the town would rejoice because they had got rid of the tyrants. It didn't work out like that. They obviously didn't know the story of Julius Caesar quite well enough. If they were familiar with Shakespeare, uh, Shakespeare wasn't born at that point in time. But if they had known more about the events of the assassination of Caesar, they might have had a better understanding. It was Lorenzo who became the, the great hero of the moment. They took various people and hanged them out of the Palazzo Signoria. It was all very nasty. Um, and and uh, there, there was a, a young bishop in town who happened to be related to the Pope. And Lorenzo Medici had to plead for the life of this boy. He, he was bishop. If you paid the money, you could have your 17-year-old nephew turned into a bishop um, in those days. It's not 
quite as corrupt nowadays. Anyway, the young man escaped with his life. Very grateful for the fact that Lorenzo had escaped. Otherwise, he wouldn't have. That was the party cons conspiracy. That was a very important event in the history of Florence because it turned Lorenzo into a, an idol. He had miraculously survived and he was later on known as Lorenzo the Magnificent because he brought so much credit to the city of Florence and he was such a wonderful patron to people like Michelangelo and Botticelli and to the various members of the Medici Academy.